Hey church, thanks for joining me tonight and tuning in for our Wednesday night Bible study prayer time. Hope you're enjoying the warm weather of this week. So we've got a lot of things upcoming. This uh, Saturday is our discipleship uh, training workshop. So if you are a discipler or you would like to be kind of considering that, want to be a part of uh, mentoring new believers, I really strongly encourage you to attend. It will begin at 10 o'clock and go to 1 o'clock this coming Saturday. And uh, we'll be equipping you, teaching you all about discipleship and what that really means biblically. And uh, we need help. We need to uh, reinforce and refill um, our volunteer base. We've got a lot of folks who want to study and learn the Bible. So I hope you'll be a part of that. Be praying for that at the least. And then this Sunday is Memorial Day weekend. And we're going to recognize uh, those who've served uh, in the military. We're going to pray for our country. And then we're going to all uh, have a great time of fellowship with a barbecue after the service, weather permitting. So I hope you'll plan to be here for that. And then remember, two weeks uh, from now, June 2nd, is our Thank God for Israel service. And I'm asking you to begin to pray now if you haven't already begun. And uh, that's always a highlight of our year. And a lot of flyers are going out and invites. So be praying for these upcoming events. I hope you're involved in your small group throughout the week and make sure you're here on Sunday and let's do everything we can to invite people to come to church. Uh, it's uh, we, uh, just a reminder every day as you watch and look around at things that are happening. It's just a reminder that uh, Jesus is our hope. And so the world needs to know that. So let's be busy sharing our faith and uh, let's be praying one for another. Check your email tonight. You'll get the updated prayer list. I want to thank Nora and John Belinsky. They do a great job keeping that up to date. And if you have requests, you can submit those and we try to rotate those in and uh, uh, make sure you're praying for those requests on the prayer list. And also you'll get an updated uh, letter from the Lions or an email. And uh, the Lions are our missionaries in Ecuador. And you'll be able to read about things that are going on with them. So. Uh, I, I want to encourage you to make sure that you uh, check your email. If you're not getting those email attachments, let us know. And we want to make sure that we get those to you. Tonight, we're back in Hebrews. We've been studying the subject of faith. And Hebrews 11 is a chapter that many describe as the chapter of faith or the hall of faith. And so uh, I believe Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews, but the, the uh, writer it has been systematically and in, in summary, but succinctly uh, reminding us of men uh, and women who lived uh, with great faith. Uh, and, and in doing so is teaching us and, and reinforcing for us that our faith needs to continually be strong in the Lord. And we are reminded that we walk by faith and not by sight. There's never a moment, never a time in which you and I should rest on the uh, depth of our faith uh, as if that's all we'll ever need. We are to continue to build upon our most holy faith, the Bible says. And so he reminds us of some of these great uh, heroes of the faith. He finished the patriarchs, uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And today we're in Hebrews chapter 11, and he now introduces or reminds us of a man named Moses. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, he was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ as greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of the blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying or trying to do, they were drowned. And so he gives just a, a, a brief recap of the life and then of the ministry of Moses. And we're introduced to Moses uh, for the first time in Exodus chapter 1. And you'll remember Joseph 
died and the Pharaoh who was friendly and kind to Joseph and had that relationship uh, with Joseph was now uh, gone and a new Pharaoh was on the scene and he perceived the Hebrews as being a problem because they were growing, growing, growing. And so he began to put them in hard labor. He made them slaves and seems like whatever he did to try to curtail their growth, God just prospered them. And uh, that uh, truth continues even to this day because God made promises to the Jewish people, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob that uh, their descendants would be uh, as, as many as the sand of the sea and the stars in the, in the heavens and that even though there are attempts by mankind and even to this day and you see anti-Semitism just really be uh, not only uh, being present but being uh, publicly vocalized and, in, and people are emboldened but God will take care of his people and he promised that he would and so uh, even though Pharaoh tried to destroy them they continue to grow so Pharaoh's uh, uh, plan was let's just kill them and let's uh, diminish their population and so <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 1 he makes a decree and his decree is that uh, in verse 16 he says to the midwives or the nurses those who were involved in delivering children if a Hebrew women come and they give birth to a son then you shall kill him but if it's a daughter, then she shall live. So just get rid of the, the baby boys. Abort them in their lives. Uh, abortion and this uh, heinous uh, practice that has been legalized. And thank God there's been some progress the last few years in this country at least. Some roadblocks put in where now if somebody wants to get an abortion, it's not as easy in, in all 50 states. Uh, but our state is known for uh, the freedom in which people can readily and easily get abortions. It's not something new. And here, uh, Pharaoh said, that's how I'll curtail the Hebrew people. We will just uh, murder all the baby boys that are born. But I want you to notice verse 17, the midwives feared God and they did not uh, do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they saved the men children alive. Pharaoh was really upset, called them in, and they said, look, um, before we get there, it, it's already happened, and they, we are not going to do this. And God um, blessed them. God honored them for fearing him more than they feared the king. So then notice verse 22, Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, every son that's born, you shall cast into the river and every daughter you shall save alive. So now it was open season. If I can't trust the, the nurses and the midwives to do my bidding, then I'm going to make a public decree. Anybody and everybody, if they know of a Hebrew baby boy that is born, they have the authority to take that baby and to throw him in the river, to end his life, throw him in and, and end it by drowning or being eaten by crocodiles. And so you see the midwives practice faith and they feared God rather than fearing the king then we know in chapter 2 we're told and we read that uh, a little boy named Moses is born um, she uh, the mother's name is Jochebed the father's name is Amram he is a priest and the son is born and Bible tells us she hid him three months so again they feared God more than they feared the decree, more than they feared the government, more than they feared even mankind or, or the population. But keeping a baby quiet for three months is not an easy task. And so verse three, when she could not longer hide him, what does she do? She takes an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and laid it in the flags by the river's brink. She realized she could no longer keep this little boy in the home. She trusted God. Now think about it. Think about she and her husband. And it's inferred that her husband was involved in this as well. And as they begin to pray and as they begin to think, the only thing separating uh, uh, really death and 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 an end of life here in this situation is God's supernatural deliverance. 
maybe perhaps they thought back about their own people's history, thinking about what was the one thing that God used to save Noah and his wife and family from imminent destruction and death from the waters, the floods. Uh, God built an ark, and I find it interesting. That's what she does. And so in some ways, she does what uh, the, the Pharaoh commanded. She puts her baby boy into the river because she knows anybody and everybody else, if they find out, that's what they're going to do. But the only difference is she's going to place him in an ark in the river. And she perhaps is going to trust both he, his father, and his mother are going to trust that as God saved Noah and his family in an ark, that God would save uh, this little boy. We're told that this little boy was a uh, perfect, and in Hebrews chapter 11, or I'm sorry, a proper child, meaning he's a good looking kid. And you know, every, every kid is a blessing and beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And I know every parent believes with all their heart, their kid is the cutest baby in the world. And that that's how it should be. But there are those kids, I think all of us would agree, wow, they're just a knockout. They just you know, uh, capture your heart and capture your attention and you can't get enough of them. And, and that's kind of the indication, uh, not even maybe physical beauty, but just his personality. And as a matter of fact, you'll find later that uh, it's that same uh, uh, personality and, and, and aura about the baby that really in, uh, in, in, in enthralls and captures the Pharaoh's daughter so that she wants to keep this baby alive. And again, we also know that God was at work and that it was God that was doing something amazing. And so dad and mom, their great faith, they go down obviously in, in trepidation, obviously with great uncertainty, but trusting as God did this once before, for his people that he would do for their family the same and they put Moses in a little ark and they put him in the shark I me mean, in the crocodile infested waters and then mom can't watch but Miriam his sister stays and what what happens the Bible says that sure enough it just so happened that Pharaoh's daughter was there at the same time in the same place where Moses would be uh, and Here's the baby crying, and she opens it and says, this is one of the Hebrews' children. And Miriam jumps up, and good for her. And maybe mom had told her, look, if whatever happens, volunteer our services in any way. And you know that Miriam would offer, do you want a Hebrew woman to nurse and raise the child until he's old enough? And then Pharaoh's daughter said, yes. And as a matter of fact, I'll take care of, of the, the woman and any expenses and she will never have to worry about any threats against the child. I'm claiming him as my own. So think about that. So who does Miriam get? Of course, her mother, Jacobed. And what a great reward. Not only is the child saved through the ark by God's deliverance, but then the parents are rewarded. Amram and Jacobed get to spend those early years with their son. And you have to know that mom and dad, every opportunity, taught the, 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 the boy as he grew older and older about God and tried to pour into him until he was weaned and old enough. And that could have been three, four, five, six years of age until he made his move into the palace. But all those years, she was able to openly carry the, the boy around and walk with him and uh, we would think about going to the park and going places and didn't have to fear of ever being reported because she had official documentation that from the Pharaoh's daughter himself. And uh, you could never have written a script like this. Uh, that is something Amram and Jacobet could have never manufactured on their own. As a matter of fact, they only experienced this situation because of faith. And as we think about Moses in Hebrews 11, where uh, the, the writer um, begins to speak about him, he, he and very um, appropriately speaks about those who were practicing faith prior to his birth and in the early years of his life because they had an influence in the life of Moses. And I just want to remind you of a couple of things. 
One, I want to remind you that your faith, my faith, or our lack of faith does have influence, does have impact in the lives of other people. Our, our children are looking to us. Our grandchildren are looking to us. Our family members. We, we've been uh, speaking about family the last couple of Sundays. And uh, the, the way we live and deport ourselves and the decisions that we make, are they rooted and based in fear? Do we just go along with things because to our best knowledge, that's all we can do and we can comprehend and we can control? Or are we willing to make decisions based on faith? Do we allow fear to cripple us or do we uh, show, do we demonstrate that uh, we are men and women who are going to trust God in the, even in the deepest and most difficult times. And if we'll do that, not only are we blessed, and again, look at Amram and Jochebed and Miriam and Aaron got to, to spend those early years with their brother, but, but Moses' life was significantly benefited because of the faith of his dad and his mom. I would even go back, even the faith of, of the midwives, who were willing that even in the face of a civil command and order, they feared a greater king, God, than they did the king of Egypt. And it reaped dividends. And as a parent, if you and I learn to trust God, it, it will reap dividends in our children's lives. Maybe you don't have kids, um, but you have influence in people's lives. And so that's why the Bible tells us to walk by faith. It's not just so that we can survive and we can honor God and we can do the things he wants us to do. That is a reason, but we're to walk by faith also so that it demonstrates to those who are walking around us and with us and who are observing us so that they can see Jesus Christ and glorify him through our faith. So be mindful that your faith or your lack of faith does influence other people. And then secondly, surround yourself with people who walk by faith. Uh, it's important to do that. Uh, you see that these midwives stuck together and here's what we're going to do. And they went in and they told Pharaoh when confronted, look, sometimes we get there and the babies already are born. There's not much we can do about it. Um, I mean, they, they, they made statements and I'm sure there's some truth in that. The, the reality was, and God protected them. They, their lives were on the line. They could have been killed, and God didn't let that happen. If you think about Amram and Jochebed, they, they held on to their baby boy for three months. A lot of things could have happened in that first three months. And then when they couldn't, they trusted in God's deliverance. They gave God every opportunity to do something miraculous. And what happened? God did it. And they, they worked together. They were unified in that. Uh, you know, faith breeds other faith and, 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 and increased faith. And so I think in your life and in mine, it's a reminder that we do well when we surround ourselves with people who are walking by faith. If you uh, spend most of your time with people who know not God, it, it wears on you. At times you can feel like you're the only one and, 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 and it can really uh, uh, cause a blow to your faith at times. Or in, in even um, as equally uh, detrimental as if you spend time with Christians um, who uh, are weak in their faith and they're always worrying, they're always doubting, they're always fearful, uh, it can take a toll. And so I believe it's imperative that we have people in our lives that we know will challenge us to build our faith and to take those steps and will remind us, hey, remember what God did before? Uh, remember how God delivered in the past? He can do that again and step out and we'll pray with you and we'll walk with you on this journey and we'll trust God with you. And that makes a big difference. So just want to encourage you tonight that our faith has influence. And I hope that you and I recognize that. And I hope that we'll spend time with people that influence us and help us in growing our faith. And then in turn, we'll do the same for other people coming behind us. And so we're excited as we continue to study Moses in the weeks to come. And I hope it'll be a challenge to you and me. Let's pray, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You, know, you tell us what we need to do. Thank you. You give us illustrations and examples. Help our faith. Thank you for those midwives, Lord. Thank you for Amram and Jacobed. Lord, the only thing they knew to do was to trust you. And they did what, what had been done in the past. And they... They put their little boy in an ark because you had used an ark before to provide deliverance. And uh, they gave you an opportunity to do something amazing. And Lord, we know that's 
the result of faith. So help us to walk by faith. Help us to realize our faith does influence others. And I pray that we would put ourselves around people that can build our faith as well. And so, Lord, as we pray tonight and go through the rest of the week, be glorified and honored. Help us to walk by faith, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. And God willing, we'll see you this Saturday and definitely this Sunday as we worship together.